The 26-year-old Habilingpe branch manager of Mawako restaurant, Jihad Chiban, who is accused of assaulting Evelyn Boache, a caterer at the restaurant, has been granted a bail of 20,000 cities with two sureties by the Abakan District Court. Jihad is accused of shoving the face of the caterer into blended pepper. Lawyers for Jihad, who have pleaded not guilty to the charge, argued he was granted entitled to bail since investigations have been concluded. Join us as Joseph Akable was in court and has more in this report. So I'm here at the AMA Wakaikwe North Sub Metropolitan District Council Office where the Abekan District Court is located. Now this matter clearly is one that has uh, generated the interest of many Ghanaians across the country and it was evidenced by the fact that many took the court's premises to view proceedings. The courtroom ordinarily takes 22 persons. All the seats were filled while others waited patiently outside. I engaged some of them to find out what brings them to the courtroom and this is what they had to say. You know, since we are all in a way promoting affirmative action and since we want our ladies to be bold enough to cater for us and also to be with us it is our view that when they are in instances we must come in to give them the moral support in just here to witness what is going on over here yeah the ruling should be in the favor of the Ghanaian lady yeah, yeah. because right now the Lebanese is free he's free right now as I'm speaking I'm also here to support right the lady we are, no, we are in Ghana, we have to make sure that anything that goes on, no, we support our own. Yeah. Yeah. For the matter itself, first and foremost, there were some changes in the legal team. Julio de Medeiros joined Asafuije, who represented Jihad Chaban, the accused, last week. Whilst Francis Xavier Sosu, a known human rights activist, joined prosecution, he said he was holding criminal brief for the complainant in the matter. I'm in this matter to be uh, holding criminal watching brief on behalf of the victim in, in the matter. Uh, clearly, uh, we take the view that this is a very serious uh, violation of the victim. Uh, it violates her right to personal dignity under Article 15 of the Constitution. So whilst we put our team together to look at the possibility of taking a civil action and a human rights action against uh, the Morocco fast foods, uh, it is important that we would join in the trial. And we are doing this on express instruction by the victim and the family who wants us to assist them to make sure that they get justice in this matter. Evelyn Boachi, who is the complainant in this particular matter, first told the court her side of the story where he narrated how on the 26th of February, her face was thrusted into blended pepper by Jihad Chaban. Again, the blender in question was presented to the court and tendered in as evidence, after which he reenacted the entire incident. Lawyers for the accused person, led by Julio de Medeiros, put a forceful argument asking that the accused be granted bail. This request was granted by Victoria Ganza, who heard the matter, who was of the view that the accused had met the requirements for a bail. Lawyer Julio de Medeiros was excited by this decision. He made a very good case for why why the bill, my client should be admitted to bill. The, the court agreed with us that all the uh, condition precedents for the admission of a suspect to bill has been met and uh, we are quite excited. I mean, that's what I say. We are quite excited. You yourself know that the case has started. So uh, I wouldn't want to go into the facts of the matter. For now, uh, the prosecution have... Uh, puts the, uh, the, the complainant in the box. She has finished giving her the testimony. We will start, we've started cross-examination. We've sealed her mouth and we'll come back on Monday to continue. 26-year-old Jihad Chaban is supposed to report at the Tessano police station two times a week on Tuesday and Friday. The matter itself comes back to the Abekan District Court on Monday, 20th of March, where hearing is expected to continue. Reporting for Joy News, Joseph Akable, Abekan District Court. A meeting by the Professor Kwesi Boche Committee tasked to investigate why the NDC lost the 2016 election was disrupted on Thursday in the Eastern Region capital Koforidia by supporters of the party over the participation of the original executives. The supporters claimed the executives whom they accused of embezzling campaign funds were the cause of the party's humiliating defeat and should therefore not be allowed to sit through the meeting. 
The original executives of the NDC, in a bid to reduce the popularity of the MPP in the region, declared an agenda 50-50 results in the eastern region. But the final result was nothing close to 50-50. The MPP's Nane Kufuadu polled 62.4% of the votes with John Mahama of the NDC polling 36.6%. There was similar trend in the results across the country, but supporters of the NDC in the eastern region say the decision by party executives to embezzle campaign funds was the reason for the party's poor showing, at least in the region. They claim the regional chairman, this Terry Boaten, hardly did any work for the party in the region in the 2016 elections. But when the person is not willing, let the person, my pet for instance, is Hamad Reggie for instance, where our candidate is not, he, he doesn't have ear listening. Whatever he tells me, just whatever she wants. How do we win the election? How the president wants to get a vote from there? The money that we're giving to them, where their personal, they think the money is for their personal, they work and they got the money. So they doesn't know the use of the money. The money was not given to them to run their family affairs. The money was given to them to run the party. They demanded that he recused himself from the meeting called by the party election review committee by the chairman of the committee. Professor Kusibuchi wanted him to sit in, something the supporters did not agree to. So angry were the supporters that they mounted roadblocks to prevent the committee members from driving to the Redick Hotel in Kufridra venue for the meeting. They held in salt at the executives, threw away chairs and tables in a desperate bid to scuttle the meeting. Some of the executives accused the regional executives of diverting campaign funds into building houses and hotels for their personal use. A claim that cannot be independently verified by MajoyOnline.com. The regional executives have, however, dismissed the claim. After several discussions, Calm finally returned and the meeting got underway. The national organizer of the NDC, Kofi Adams, is, meanwhile says the party is not perturbed by the action and rather emboldened by it. The incident that happened for me, I'm quite happy about it. It shows that the party is very strong. It shows that people are very much interested in the party and they will work so hard to bring the party back to power almost immediately. If they were not interested, in the party, if they were not interested in getting to the solution, they would not be behaving the way they behave today. The Professor Butcher Committee has been in the region not just today. They have done 17 constituencies already. Today was the turn for the Kofolibia Zone. But the members of the party who met there thought that the regional executives, who by themselves were part of the constituency activities in those areas where should not sit in. And that is how we want it done. We don't want the influence of national or regional executives in the activities that the Prosabotue Committee is doing. So the executives and then the branch members and the rest who didn't want the regional executives to sit in, I think we're in the right because that is how we expect the work to be, to be done. Elsewhere, the family of a 22-year-old man allegedly shot by police in the Volta region is demanding justice from the state. Achu in Kegbe was killed Wednesday following clashes between residents of Edna in the Ketusa district of the Volta region and workers of a salt mining company. This was after the police's attempt to restore law and order turned bloody. The deceased was one of the many residents protesting the presence of the salt mining company for denying the residents their livelihood. Uh, look at the whole area. A Vudukata Even a Keholi they are salty. The salt mining company was given some conditions for the operation, but has not been faithful. This is the root of the problem. The deceased was the breadwinner for the family since his father was taken ill. Now that he is dead, the family is in great despair. And likewise, is the same thing. 
But the staff of the company who recounted the incident to join you said residents on Rampage went on Rampage to try every property in sight after forcing their way into the company's concession. Yes, from Tuesday, mm -hmm. as I said. Yeah. Uh, around one, one, uh, that's, uh, one thirty precisely. Mm -hmm. The Bebe Kope, Achu Kope, uh, Martin Kope, and it's around me, mm. down to Nubuku. Mm -hmm. They enter the concession of the 7C Salt Limited mm. and Money Salt when they were prevented. They mobilized. They mobilized their men and attacked the police. Meanwhile, the police make arrest of four women. Mm -hmm. Okay, so has there been any ag agreement between these two, um, the communities and the company, to mine here? No, there's no. Okay. No, no agreement. I know. Okay. But that one is the concession is for the uh, the seven C South Limited. Okay. Okay, so uh, right now, what, what what did they damage? You you were mentioning some yes, of the things. Yes, the money, the damage, the the, the, the computers, mm -hmm. they took the washing uh, car washing machine. Mm -hmm. They they enter and took uh, a drum drums of engine oil, the motor three, mm -hmm. and then uh, the pumping machine motors, and they damage all the pumping. The new uh, site the, that was built. The and the new site was built for uh, washing. Mm -hmm. They destroyed those places. That's when you go there, you see it. The police, on the other hand, have condemned the action of their Dina residents, explaining it was a criminal action that must be dealt with. Okay. This is purely criminal. Okay. You invade somebody's concession or a factory, fetch that sort belonging to the company and then cost them attack life and property loot computers and what have you office equipment and including motorbikes and then uh, also cost damage to the vehicle park in the compound this is barbaric art okay. we don't have to encourage it all right okay you see it when we do that, we will push investors away from the country because these are expatriates who have invested in this area. And the whole of the people in the community, I think if they sit down and enjoy joy very well, everybody will have a share of the cake. Okay. But with this approach, I think it's not the best. Uh. And so we call on all opinion leaders, people in the community, the chiefs, the regional minister, so that they could meet the people of the community, find their problem, and find appropriate way of addressing this issue. Okay. Because this is, the, this is not the first time it's occurring. It's occurred last year, and this year too, it is okay. Parliament has directed the Interior Minister to institute immediate investigations into clashes between residents of Miochu and Doenya in the Tema area, which led to the death of one person in December last year. The deceased was allegedly shot by policemen who were called in to restore order in a dispute over land. Second Deputy Speaker Alban Bagbin, who presided over Thursday's sitting, has also directed the Interior Minister to take immediate steps to disband armed gangs in the area said to be, be behind armed attacks over land. The directive was prompted by concerns raised by MP for Ningo Pram Pram, Sam George, that residents could be arming themselves to retaliate if the policemen suspected of killing their kinsmen are not brought to book. He tells Joy News there is tension between residents in the two communities. There are issues about land, especially between the people of Dawenya and Miocho, that had led to one or two skirmishes, especially notably the death of Mr. Francis Tetebotre, on the 29th of December 2016, I sought the leave of Mr. Speaker to direct the Minister for Interior to immediately take steps to institute an investigation into the sad events of 29th December. 
I'm grateful to Mr. Speaker that he's granted those reliefs. He's instructed the Minister for Interior to immediately liaise with the relevant agencies to start a disarmament of groups that are armed in the constituency in those two townships, and then also to constitute or institute immediate investigations into the unfortunate incidents that led to the death of Mr. Francis Tetebotre on the 29th of December 2016. It is my hope that this will bring some sanity and closure of some sort to, 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 to the matter. This incident happened about 11 weeks ago, as you indicated on the floor. Um, how have the two communities been since then, looking at the fact that uh, no major investigation you know, had been commissioned and no one had been sanctioned in connection with it? There is an uneasy everyday activities, all, all, all right. But between those who are the landowners, they, are, they, are, they have become no-go areas in the constituency where some people from Miocho can go to certain parts of Dawenya, some people from Dawenya can come into certain parts of Miocho. I will not represent the people when people cannot have the freedom to move. MPs have also been discussing reforms to the Council of State. MP for Kumbungu, Rasmu Barak, who delivered a statement on the floor, says the reforms are needed to make the institution stronger. We should not reduce membership of the Council of State to people who are not just young, but people who have zero experience. And we've seen instances in the past where people have graduated from school, zero experience, in their 20s or 30s, have picked up nominations to run for membership of a council of state. You think that shouldn't happen? I mean, what advice are they coming to give the president? With all due respect, I'm a convincing advocate for opportunities for youth. I would fight for opportunities for youth any day, any time. But I think some things should be reserved for people who have come a long way or who have traveled quite a bit in terms of experience that they've garnered. It is not for nothing that it says a former chief justice. It is not for nothing that it says a former IGP. Now these are people with immeasurable amount of experience. And then you have somebody straight out of school, he's a member of the council, what advice is he proffering? So that then the idea is that what? So the, so then there the, should be an age limit or there should be a limit when it comes to the amount of experience that so whoever may have. Because we know that for some of the council of state reps, these are elections that take place at the regional level. So absolutely. anyone can get into it and, 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 and rise to the ranks. And that is why we need, we, we need to put a cap on it. Now in the UK, for instance, they have the age limit of 21. Now 21 because not because they, they, not because young people can't contribute, but because of the hereditary system, so that if your uh, relative is a member of the House of Lords and that relative passed away, you can inherit, it, inherit the person's seat. You know, so yes, combine experience, because you can have a young person with a lot of experience in their 30s, but have a limit on that so that there's clarity, so that there's no doubt in anybody's minds as to who should be on the Council of State. And I believe when, once we are able to do that, it would help us a lot. You're watching Joy News Prime. We're taking a break, but still to come in the bulletin, Joy News is on Multimedia's special assignment to get the maternity block, the abandoned maternity block of the Confanochi Hospital built, gets backing from the First Lady. And uh, I'm a woman like um, these women who go through this. And uh, I don't think in this day and age this should be happening. We'll be back with more stitching. President Akufuado has inaugurated the Board of Trustees tasked with the construction of the National Cathedral. The project forms part of the legacy project of Ghana's 60th Independence Anniversary Celebrations. The 13-member team is expected to settle on the design of the national edifice, supervise the construction work, and above all, raise funds to see to the execution of the National Cathedral. When he cut short for the construction of the National Cathedral at the Scholarship Secretariat on the 6th of March, President Akufuado said, after 60 years of independence, there is the need for the country to bridge the gap between its citizens and God. And the construction Amen. of Thank the you. National Worship Center is expected to achieve Thank that you. dream. President Kufado has inaugurated the Board of Trustees tax with the construction of the National Cathedral. The project forms part of the legacy project of the Ghana 60 years on anniversary celebrations. 
The 13th member team is expected to settle on the design of the national edifice, supervise the construction work, and above all, raise funds to execute the project. The board of trustees is made up of the chairman, Most Reverend Asante Entry, and his assistant, Archbishop Charles Palmer Bako, Prophet Kusibwatin as secretary. The rest of the members are Apostle Opoku Ojina, Reverend Joyce Agri, Presbyterian Moderator Sefas Amenyo, Right Reverend of Fair Akrofi, Archbishop Nicholas Duncan Williams, Reverend Istud Anaba, Bishop Doug Howard Mills, Pastor Mensa Otabo, Reverend Dr. Fempo Manson, and former moderator of the Presbyterian Church, Professor Emone Marty. I will be in charge of it from three critical points of view. First of all, agreeing on the design. Secondly, supervising the construction. And equally important, raising the money for the whole exercise. And that's the purpose. Those are the main purposes of the board. Brought you here as leaders of the Christian community, but not necessarily that you're representing the various churches that you lead. It's obviously of great benefit to the project that those who are responsible for them are virtually the entire leadership of the Christian community of our country. In response on behalf of the board, the chairman, right Reverend Asante Entry said, the team is in a hurry, just like the president disclosed in his State of the Nation address, to deliver the project for the Christian community of Ghana. He assured the president the board will get to work almost immediately. We are conscious of the fact that uh, tabernacles and temples and cathedrals are all religious uh, symbols, very, very much important for us. And we are so happy that uh, you've dreamed about this thing for this nation. Of course, um, we have uh, a very huge one at the Ka Kaokudi for our Muslim brothers. And some of us are so proud of it. So to dream or have a vision for another one for the Christian community, I think it's, it's, it shows a sign of uh, cordiality between the two major religions in this country. <laughs> government has promised massive transformation in procurement in government institutions with the introduction of electronic systems. The policy plan, which is expected to kickstart in June this year, is expected to ensure transparency by making it possible for the general public to track the procurement process from start to finish. Vice President Dr. Mamadou Dubamia, who lauded the initiative, said 93 percent of corruption in the public sector happens through the procurement process and the country is losing so much money. He expressed hope the initiative will expose the corrupt practices in procurement and save the nation a lot of money. The Vice President also promised the CEO of the Procurement Authority full government support and encouraged the authority not to bow to political pressures regardless of where it comes from. For every procurement, there's going to have to be due diligence and value for money audit before there is approval. You need due diligence and value for money audit before there is approval. This is new, uh, and a new team is going to be set up here to do this. And then what is also most important, we want to bring in a lot of transparency in the procurement process. Usually you don't know. You just hear this person has been awarded a contract uh, and there's no reason for, for, you don't even know the basis. Yeah. But with a move, we want to bring in technology. And so we are moving towards e-procurement. The chief executive has already said that uh, starting in June, Inshallah. <laughs> Starting in June, we are going to begin e-procurement, which means that every procurement will have its own unique 
identification number. So you can go onto the website, enter that identification number, and you will know the stage of the procurement process. And, and you can track it you know, from each stage to the end. You know, and you, so it is going to be very transparent. You know which companies have bid, you know, what the, the, which, one you know, which one is winning, and everybody will know. You will, there wouldn't be any surprises that you, you don't know how this company that has not got any experience or any records in doing this suddenly wins it. Newly appointed CEO of the Public Procurement Authority, Frank Ejenim Watting Eje, in an interview said his outfit will invoke appropriate sanctions on persons who flout the procurement process. All government institutions engaging in procurement That's right. are going to have continuous audits, which is different from the annual statutory audits okay. that the Auditor General conducts. All right. Besides, the Auditor General's emphasis is not on procurement per se. But for PPE to conduct procurement audits, what we mean is that we come in to assess the entire procurement processes. You know, the procurement for, sorry, competitive bidding, uh, request for proposals, yeah. and other methods of procurement doesn't come for procurement approval. It doesn't come for pre-approval. Uh, so they do it on their own. Okay. Therefore, conducting the, the audits, audits yeah. will reveal enemies' procurements. Right. And in, do, in doing so, we will be able to invoke the appropriate sanctions. That's right. Your Excellency, we are going to be on these entities this time around to invoke appropriate sanctions. Absolutely. Those who are found to have, uh, you know, uh, gone foul to the law will not be spared. Now, First Lady Rebecca Kufado is promising to look into the needless debts at the Confanoche Teaching Hospital as revealed in joining the special assignment documentary next to die. She says Kwame Watting in that documentary revealed how at least four babies die at the hospital's mother and baby unit every day and how pregnant women in labor are compelled to join long queues to deliver. On the average, about 100 pregnant women who report at the facility to deliver die annually. Doctors there blame these preventable deaths largely on the lack of space, while a building meant to solve the problem has been under construction for the last 43 years. Thursday afternoon, the first and second ladies received copies of the documentary from a delegation from the Multimedia Group Limited, led by the managing director of Multi TV, Santok Singh. A copy of a documentary was, which was uh, produced by Seth Kwame Boateng uh, with regards to the situation in Kumfuanoche uh, Hospital in Kumasi. Whereby, in fact, uh, it was, he chanced upon this situation because he was doing a documentary on prostate cancer mm -hmm. when he went to the hospital and came across this uh, situation there. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. So then we decided that this is something very crucial that we, we thought by highlighting that could help uh, us uh, get the issue resolved. Not immediately perhaps, but after a certain uh, period of time. So we would like to seek your help to, with your influence and indulgence in this situation to help us push for this building which was started 43 years ago to be completed. <laughs> That's one. I mean, that, that is in the, in the long term that we want this building to be completed. But maybe in the short and medium term, how do we can reduce the death of babies, like four, at least four babies a day, sometimes 10. And also the, uh, reduce the death of mothers uh, during childbirth. So something that we would like you to have a copy and The First Lady, unhappy with the situation at the Confanochi Teaching Hospital, questioned why this must be going on in a premium hospital like the Confanochi Teaching Hospital. She had the promise to look into it and see how best she could intervene to hold the needless debts. I have seen a little bit of it on television, but not very much. And I must say it was rather, rather touching to see what is going on in this particular, um, is it a Kumasi? Um, Konfuanoshi Hospital. I cannot understand how a building has been going on or being built for the last 44 years. 
And um, I definitely would uh, look into it and see what I can do. I'm a woman like um, these women who go through this. And uh, I don't think in this day and age this should be happening to any woman in the world. And so thank you very much for this presentation. I'll come back to you okay. after I've watched it fully and, um, and to think through with other people what we can do to help uh, as soon as possible. Wife of the Vice President, Amira Baumia, also promised to support the First Lady to fix the problem. So as our First Lady has said, um, she's going to look into how to help resolve this matter in the shortest possible time, and we're all going to support her efforts towards it. And thank you for your efforts at Joy as well. We appreciate it. Hello again, good evening, and thanks for joining me on business. A former Deputy Minister of Finance, Kweku Ricketts Hagan, says he fully supports the nomination of three Deputy Finance Ministers, describing it as crucial because the current developments in the economy warrant it. Government has been heavily criticized following the nomination of three Deputy Ministers for various ministerial positions, for various ministries, resulting in total, a total number of ministers in the, this administration reaching 110, the highest in the history of the country. Mr. Ricketts Hagen tells Joy Business the kind of work at the Ministry of Finance needs more than two deputies. At the moment, the old structure is that you have two deputies. One deputy is responsible for finance. Then you have the other deputy who is responsible for economic strategy. With the financial services, you need someone who is really dedicated to looking at basically helping shape up our financial intermediaries in the system. But the euro bond and the type of other bonds that we are beginning to expose ourselves to in the market. You need that kind of a financial, economics, political lead. The Ministry of Finance is at the center of the whole economy. And one of the things that we've been trying to do in the last four years is actually to try and anchor all the ministries to the Ministry of Finance, especially to do with how projects and other things are planned. And so the workload there can be extremely heavy if the work is to be done properly. Additional person may not be needed, but additional person can be helped. Greater Accra may have been adjudged the second best performing region on the annual district league table, but still has a lot of work to do as far as sanitation is concerned. The Center for Democratic Development, CDD, at a regional launch of the district league table, revealed no community in the region has been certified as open defecation free. Research fellow at CDD, Mohamed Awal, says the region has a lot to do to address the worrying trend. Out of the 27 million population, 10 million do not have access to basic services like health, basic education, access to good sanitation, and potable water. Those who have access to these services have it at a minimal level. That's the revelation coming from the 2016 finding on the district league table. Though the greater Accra region is ranked highly, open deprecation still remains a major challenge. Why is it that many of our districts are unable to provide these services? What is the problem? Because we said that our district assemblies are supposed to be responsible for the overall development of our district. But we found that the men of our district are unable to discharge that responsibility. The other issues that we find that is worrying is the within region inequality. Within a specific region, you would find some districts that are doing well, or some citizens, some districts that are enjoying these basic services that we try to measure. Unfortunately, all the 16 districts in Accra do not have any of their communities that have been certified to be open duplication free, let alone the entire district. For me, that is what is worrying. So, is the problem with the way we are doing urbanization? This district league table was put together in collaboration with the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development, UNICEF Ghana, Ghana Center for Democratic Development, CDD. Introduced in 2014, it is a social accountability tool that runs Ghana's 216 districts by their level of development and service delivery. 
Director for Research Statistics and Information Management at the Local Government Ministry, Dorothy Oni, says the objective of the District League table is to help improve the living conditions and not to put a spotlight on districts that are not providing basic services. So what we are saying to the region, the coordinating councils and the districts, the coordinating directors and the planners, is that these indicators of the district league table should be merged into the indicators that the assemblies are addressing or pursuing in their planning and their budgeting processes. This is the third year for the district league table. Well, I would want to find out what has happened to the previous years. What did we do with those findings? What that is why we are, I mean, in sense to because, you know, we were talking about misconception of the two. So the various assemblies feel it's like we are ranking them. So it's like it's ranking how districts are, are being developed. It's ranking how the services we are providing to districts in way of development, in education, water, security, all those, how the districts are faring and not how the assembly is faring. Shanti region topped as the best performing region, with the Greater Accra region coming second. The Volta region emerged last among the 10 regions. For Joy News, Matilda from Agam, Accra. And staying with the CDD, we just have a statement from the Ghana Center for Democratic Development, and it has to do with the uh, President Akufuado's appointment of 110 ministers and deputy ministers. Now, it reads, uh, the Ghana Center for Democratic Development is deeply dismayed by a report that President Akufuado has nominated an additional 54 people to serve as ministers or deputies to the various ministries. When confirmed by Parliament, as they are more likely to, that would bring the total number of ministers and deputy ministers appointed so far in the Kufuado led administration, MPP government, to an unprecedented 110. Now, Ghana, CDD Ghana considers this move and the obscene number of ministers a wrong one for several reasons. And this is just for the first one of them. It says it would represent the largest ministerial team assembled by any president, head of state of Ghana, since independence. It is, in addition, it also sets a negative record for a country infamous for its oversized ministerial teams. And it goes on to talk about places like countries such as the United States States, uh, which is more economically and financially complex. It talks about India and several other countries. It says they don't have as many ministers. It says, secondly, the appointment betray inadequate insensitivity to the weak fiscal condition of the country today as it flies in the face of the president's promise to protect the public purse. It is difficult to see how appointing such a large number of ministers who will all be on ministerial salaries and benefits can possibly amount to the promise of protecting the public purse. And thirdly, it says it further undermines Ghana's already weak state bureaucracy, placing a team of polit politician ministers on top of the existing hierarchy of the ministries will lead to unnecessary duplication of senior personnel and eventually undermine the authority of the professional senior civil and public servants. And then it says, in addition, the appointment of that many ministers does not in any way help to address the structural weakness of parliament vis-a-vis -vis the executive, which the president alluded to in the State of the Nation address. Now, in conclusion, the CDD says it's, it's urging the Kufuadu-led Kufu MPP administration to be sensitive to the voice of the people and take steps to reduce the growing burden on the public purse. Thank you.